Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Hey, you know who we're talking to again, Jean? Christopher Williams, one of my favorite peeps. Yeah, he's great from the Capital Region Prism, and he's going to talk about not invasive plants this time, but invasive bugs and other critters. Yep, we're tackling the, well, not lions and tigers and bears. Almost. But spongy moths and yeah. jumping worms. And, and emerald ash borers. And emerald and, ash borers. Ugh, all those terrible things. You know, if we could only turn them against each other. Yeah, yeah, or people we don't like. That would be good, too. There you go. There yeah. you go. But he's really knowledgeable. And, you know, some of these, to be serious, are really, really terrible pests out there. I know spongy moss have been really bad this year. So he's going to give us a lot of information on how to identify and how to manage them and how to deal with them. I think we should listen in. Hi, I'm Jean Thomas. And I'm Tim Kennelty. Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We're talking again today to Christopher Williams, PRISM Coordinator for the Capital Region PRISM. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you for having me today. So can you remind us what the acronym PRISM stands for and generally what your group does? Hi, I'm Chris Williams from the Capital Region PRISM, a partnership for regional invasive species management. We're one of eight PRISMs in the state that are funded by the New York State DEC, and each PRISM has a different host. Thank you for having me today. And again, PRISM stands for? Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. It's it's a test that we always do when you come by, right? <laughs> yeah. Make sure you remember the acronym. So so you, one of the great things you do, and I know we were beneficiaries at the Land Conservancy, is you manage a lot of grants, and you do a lot of grant work with a lot of your partner organizations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. We have a host of deliverables that we fulfill for the New York State DEC education and outreach, early detection and rapid response, but we also coordinate efforts with our partners. And one of the ways we do that is we offer a request for proposals. Typically in December of each year, we will make an announcement that our funding window for applications is open and we will have people apply for funds. Our requests for proposals are up to $25,000 and the purpose of them is to help assist partners with managing invasive species with projects that are tied to our annual work plan. And there is a host of proposals that have been completed over the last five years, and there's quite the range. But it's an opportunity for people to seek funding uh, that doesn't require a match. And we are directly funded from the Environmental Protection Fund through the state. It needs to be aligned to our work plan that has justifications for the work that's and, being done. And tell us about a really cool example of one that has recently got a grant that you're excited about. Y- yes. We have a new partnership with the Grasslands Bird Trust in Fort Edward, New York. Washington County, New York, has a bird wildlife management area. It's about an 18,000 acre parcel wow. and there are state lands there and surrounding the outside of that are private preserves for those rare and endangered or species of concerns like the short-eared owl the snowy owl but the bird grassland trust sought us out and we had several meetings with uh, some of their staff about how to prioritize and control invasives in some of the grasslands they had noted that their bird counts were down And it's hard to prove why a bird count is down, except for in this case, where the invasives are, 
the bird counts were down and the parcels right next to it where the mm-hmm. native sedges and grasses were, the bird counts were fine. Huh. So there was quite a strong correlation there. And uh, they have a research proposal, but we're setting up research grids where they're going to do some selective herbicide treatment to get rid of thistles and knapweed. Uh, our favorites. Yeah. yeah. And then there's some other treatments that they're going to do to get rid of reed canary grass. At the same time, post-treatment follow-up will be letting the native seed bank take over and then using introducing new seed bank as a restoration project. And so there's some small parcels being to set up so how these treatments will work. There's a lot of interest in this project because there are, this knapweed is a threat to the actual state lands. And so the partnership for this, it's quite involved. There are the state biologists involved, there's the PRISM, and then the Grassland Trust people. And so we're working together to initiate this pilot project. And I'm really excited. It sounds very cool. Yeah, yeah. and everybody's on board. Uh, yeah. it, you know, So it's kind of like a win-win, let's do this. There's a good volunteer base. So that's an example of a project. And we're, we're funding all the equipment supplies. We've brought in consultants from Cornell to actually help with making decisions and how to set up like these these parcels for studying. So there, there's quite an army of people involved in this little project. So last time you were here, I think we asked you how you didn't get depressed. And I now understand how you're not depressed because things like this give you a little hope, right? Yeah. So we're actually applying science that's prescriptive in nature. And there's an outcome that we're expecting. Very cool. How many acres is it again? The Grasslands Bird Trust has two parcels. Um, that are around 80 acres, but it's part of a bigger complex for an ecological connectivity. The Fort Edward grasslands, it's called, in Washington County is around 18,000 acres that have been identified as critical habitat for certain species. That's awesome. The difference you can make will be phenomenal. Yeah, it's just a small project. Great. Okay, last time you were here, we talked about invasive terrestrial plants we're, and some aquatic We're going to turn today to invasive animals and pathogens. Now, I notice that you have some of our arch enemies listed as tier three and four, like jumping worms and emerald ash borer, Japanese beetles, hemlock woolly adelgid, and marmorated stink bugs, my favorite. Does that mean we've already lost the battle to these pests? They have been here an awfully long time. I would say no, we have not lost the battle. I would say that there are some species that have in certain specific cases. So I, I th- I'd like to take a look at these as individuals and look at them individually and not holistically. Obviously, the emerald ash borer, that creature is fast moving. And so its spread throughout New York was rather quick. And it's unfortunate that we have the loss of the ash trees throughout New York. And I do see the damage. When I drive, I have family in Buffalo. I live in the capital region. When I do the drive, I see thousands and thousands of dead ash trees. Um, So that's an unfortunate case. Learning lessons from that species and the transportation of firewood, which should not be done. We shouldn't be moving firewood around. There are measures that we can do in the future to help curb these infestations. Then on another scale, some of these other pestilence, like hemlock woolly adelgid, they don't move as fast. And the cold winters keep them at bay somewhat to buy time for biocontrol release. So, yeah, I like to look at all these forest pests and pathogens uh, as, a, a, you know, what can we learn from them and how can we use that information to hopefully do a better job in the future. So, so where are we with emerald ash borer? I mean, I know I've lost hundreds on my property. Are there... Are we finding disease-resistant trees? Like, is there some hope for the future of the ash trees? I would say yes, there's hope for the future. And why I would like to say that is I know that there's a couple programs out there where they are looking for some ash trees are resistant to the ash borer. I've read that, and I took a program once. It's like one in a thousand. So if you have like a an ash stand and you know it got struck hard by the emerald ash borer, but there's a tree that didn't, that's worth maybe reporting. From a scientific perspective, it's nice to have a plot set up first and really monitor the mortality over time. So I know that there's somebody in state that's doing a project for that, a private group. And then I also know the federal government has been involved with basically collecting scions, uh, branches Mm -hmm. of the trees and grafting them. So there's a program in place that could see the return of the ash tree. I just don't know if it'll be a cultivar or a hybrid But I think that would take a really long time to have a a tree that's resistant and then to reintroduce it to our 
are it's going to take probably it's, a lifetime. It's it's like the disease resistant elms that are just starting to come out. Yeah, right? and the chestnuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it does. It takes decades and decades of research, but it's nice to know that we live in a period of time where these practices can be put in place right. to help preserve for future release again. So I think it's great. On the other hand, is the emerald ash borer. The federal quarantine was lifted. They recognize that there's nothing they can do, and it, it's it's running its course, unfortunately, right now. I do recommend to landowners two things. If they have an ash stand with really good ash trees that are saw timber grade that could be harvested, I, there's economic value there, and they could seek out a harvest. And I always tell them, just turn around and use the funds to replant a new forest mm-hmm. for regeneration. The other part is if your ash trees have been hit by the emerald ash borer they're they're very dangerous to fell those trees the interior of the tree you know the rot is is not uniform throughout the tree and when you fell a tree that's an ash tree that's dead it doesn't fall like it would normally do so they're a human health hazard after the fact so that's why i kind of encourage people to remove their ash trees for a harvest before they get struck but on the back side not every homeowner has emerald ash borer so again don't be spreading and moving your infected trees around because then you're just you know you might be causing an economic loss or a damage to a town or a park or preserve or a private landowner by inadvertently spreading it and if they're in a place that it's not danger to people it isn't it true that you'd want to leave some of the snags for wildlife as well yeah that is another recommendation and that's one i do give like you know some of those birds will like those hollowed out trees for a habitat but it might be with caution with saying that because again you get a windstorm and you're walking around in right. an ash stand of dead trees that that could be hazardous so i gotta throw that in there you right know. absolutely <laughs> dead trees those widow makers are not good mm. okay hemlocks i adore hemlocks they have such a wonderful history and now these stinky nasty woolly adelgids are going on what's the future with that I live in a place where the hemlock stands are 68% of the trees on the Adirondack Blue Line. The New York State Hemlock Initiative, led by Mark Whitmore, they have a biocontrol program. One of our partnerships with them through the New York State DEC is to identify infestations on the leading edge before it gets into the Adirondack Park, which we now know it is, but to encourage private and public landowners to do treatments on that leading edge on the back side is releasing biocontrols to do studies to see if they're taking. So we're trying to buy time through managing identification and management. But it's hard over a large scale. There's a lot of parcels that are being taken care of, then there's some that's not. And the adelgid isn't found everywhere. You can go down to like, you know, it's been in New York since 1980. You can go in the lower Hudson, you can go down around Ithaca and the southern tier, and you'll have dead hemlock stands. And then you can go... <laughs> just down the road and there's a thriving hemlock stand so it's intermittent it's not found everywhere and there is mortality with really cold winters except for the the punctuated equilibrium problem where the ones that did survive may be more cold tolerant so wait a minute punctuated equilibrium i like that that's one we've never heard i gotta write that down yeah i I think that's a biological term i learned back in college (laughs) (laughs) that sometimes there's uh, responses in the environment and you know organisms adapt really quickly and yeah. then have offspring that adjust to it think of a fruit fly think of these smaller you know high rates of reproductivity yeah, right. i'm not i'm not an expert in that field but it's a cool word so there are some biocontrols for hemlock woolly adelgid that are out there now there are the hemlock initiative which is also funded through the state through the new york state dec mark whitmore has done a good job first the adelgid that's been let loose here in New York is probably from Christmas tree stock that's been transported, mm. and the species is native to Japan. So there is a natural predator in Japan that's been introduced. They call it Little Larry. It's, it's a beetle, but it eats one of the generations of HWA. So there's two generations a year for mm-hmm. HWA, and it is eating one of them. Now, it's not active when the adelgid has its second offspring are born. So there's a need for another predator. Yeah. And so Mark Whitmore has gone to the Pacific Northwest where hemlock trees exist with a, another hemlock woolly adelgid species. And they're trying to reintroduce reintrodu- that 
predator here in New York, and it's a silver fly, and there's two of them. There's a couple other predators I'm not fully aware of, but currently we're trying to get that silver fly to overwinter in this region, and hopefully that will take. The, the, the beetle is doing well. It, there is offspring, but it's not enough to, to prevent the, the loss. So it's biological control research and assessments in action, and it's kind of neat. So and, and then the slow moving of the adelgid, is buying us the time, and the cold winters do help. Oh, so it's a good combo platter then that there's actually this research and it's not moving as quickly as some of the others. Yeah, so it's a nice c- compare and contrasting to uh, the emerald ash brain because right, right. that Which little guy can fly. So quickly, yeah. yeah, where the adult is slow moving. I like little Larry. I like little Larry. I like that, That's nice. that name. It's a good one. I, nice. I think the scientific name is Laracupus nigris. Ah, okay. I may have butchered of, that. Of, of course, of course it is. I like little Larry. I'm going to name my next child. So that, that <laughs> another miracle we're talking about. So, so marmorated stink bug is such an awful pest and it's doing so much destruction in commercial agriculture right not just our own gardens and i always think that it's about where the damage is happening and who whose pocketbook is being affected so i would think that there would be some money behind controlling that is that not true yeah so i am not an expert on the brown marmorated stink bug i know it's an agricultural threat And I think it's important looking at our food supply and that the threat to our food supply from these invasives is controlling for them. Your farmers do have a lot of options available to them. The regulations for, you know, herbicide and insecticide controls, pesticides basically, on agricultural lands is different than on public or private. And I don't know a lot about the controls, so it's maybe not the best topic area Mm -hmm. for me. And it is a problem. And there is a host of other agricultural threats, and they kind of go in that same bucket. Prevention is number one, right? Let's limit them from arriving on site. Two is early identification. If they're small, found in a small pocket, you know, using those control methods to knock them out before they, like, take over our entire crop. And they are also a nuisance because they're found in our homes. Yeah, and they stink. But it's a totally different kind of situation than something like emerald ash borer than you're saying. It is. And again, the, the cost to the agricultural industry for these controls is one of those things that drive up our food prices. Right. And so, you know, protecting that food crop, you know, you really do want to limit the introduction of these agricultural pests. You know, I know the Department of Ag and Markets in New York State is very active with their horticultural inspectors. And that's why the prisms sometimes have a little disconnect with the agricultural pest because there's a lot of resources right. dedicated to them. But we do assist reporting, identification. We funded projects for agricultural. Uh, we have one right now for uh, the Asian longhorn tick in the Hudson Valley. So we do work with them uh, when things come up in terms, and there's, of course, the spotted landernfly, mm-hmm. which we are right. participating in. Jean, you have a question about spotted I Yeah, fly, they're right? really pretty. They are pretty. They really are actually a pretty insect. A bunch of us were in Pennsylvania for the International Master Gardeners Conference, and it was just arriving there. And we were going on tours of different college arboretum and things like that. And they were casually saying, oh, yeah, they're all over the place when I go to my kids' ball games. And we just scrape them off our shoes and stuff. So Mm. they're they're busily arriving here. First, I'd like to say that it, it arrived, I forget the year, 2016. And like Pennsylvania, Delaware, they're aware of the spread and they set up quarantine areas. So if there are trucks or vehicles in those quarantine areas, they get tagged. You know, they're supposed to be checked for egg casings or, you know, any of the insects and and removed. I know at the Pennsylvania borders, you know, when they have the truck station pullovers for inspections, the DEC was also inspecting vehicles to help slow the spread. So Yeah, we were being told at that point to wash our cars before we left town. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the spotted lanternfly is a, a serious agricultural threat. You know, I read a number around $470 million threat to New York State. Mm-hmm. It's a stone fruit threat, but there's other, other things like grapes and hops, which is also a big area, apples. But the quarantines in place in those states actually have slowed down the spread. Um, so I want to I want to talk about that because right? in other countries where there was no no prevention measures, it spread within a year across entire countries. Wow. So those prevention strategies do work, 
but it buys time for local government agencies, state agencies, and then the public to become aware of and then how to manage these problems. So that's really important, prevention and slowing the spread. Two years ago, Staten Island, infestation, all the boroughs, and then last year we saw it making its way up the Hudson, the lower Hudson, up to Kingston, New York, with a, you know an infestation with a breeding population. So in the cap, it's, it's here, we're in Akron, New York, so it's really close. And in our office up in Saratoga, we're busy with doing more along with Department Ag and Markets and IMAP Invasives. And what we're doing in our office is more outreach and awareness. So some things we're doing, so the Department Ag and Markets has shared a lot of like fact sheets. They have a dedicated website. If you find Spotted Lanternfly, please report it. Take pictures, location, location, clear pictures, you know, put it in a bag. Don't destroy it. So if they need to come out and confirm it, the location, then there might be a response from the state. There probably will be a response. They might come down and say, can we, can we control this? So that's important to know. IMAP Invasives has a program where you can report it. They actually have volunteer uh, grids that you can sign up for. If you go to their website, it's on there. They have actually known locations where its host tree is, the tree of heaven. And then we are also doing door-to-door to secondary growers. We have some outreach materials encouraging you know, local growers, nurseries that, hey, please be aware. If you see this, report it. And by the way, here's all the management options from Cornell Integrated Pest Management and the links to the Department of Ag and Markets. So we're trying to prepare people. This creature is coming. It will be here all throughout New York eventually. It doesn't like the colder climate, so we don't know what's going to happen up in the Adirondack Park. But it's going to eventually reach a point where it will be found throughout New York State, and it will become an, no longer an awareness issue, but how do we manage for this? And, you know, for local growers and those hops and, and those orchards, they need to prepare for the future for budgeting control measures in their yearly budgets. And the Cornell Integrated Pest Management site for Spotted Lanternfly has all of the resources. And if people are listening to this and they want to know more, reach out to one of your prisms. Most of us have links to literature that you can look up, but the Cornell Integrated Pest Management website is fantastic. Now, the actual problem, the spotted lanternfly, for example, let's just talk about grapes, all right? It'll find habitat maybe where this tree of heaven is, which you should learn to identify, which could be used as a control or trap tree. And and if you have one on your property, you want to cut it down probably, right? Or try to eliminate it, I well, assume. I'm aren't, not, they, aren't they an invasive too? Yeah. They are an invasive. So what they recommend, one of the control options is to cut down the female tree. So you reduce the spread yeah. of that plant and you leave the male tree as a trap tree. Yeah. Yeah, so identifying the male and female trees, and one of the things for like a grower, if you know you have tree of heaven, you know, you could remove the female trees, so that reducing that invasive capacity, and then you leave the male tree as a trap tree. So when they show up, I see. you can use uh, insecticides to kill the spotted lanternfly. But that's a double-edged sword, too, right? If you leave the tree there, then they're going to be attracted to the tree, and you might be inviting them. And they're really hard to get rid of anyway, aren't they? I mean, they They really root sprouts and all of that. Oh, yeah. So removing the tree is problematic because it's a colonial species. It will sucker, and if you're not using the right management techniques at the right time, you can make a mess. So there's a host tree. Knowing if you have the spotted lanternfly host tree, it's a good start, but with grapes, for example, it will feed on the grapes, right? It'll nibble on them, it'll bite them, and then it has honeydew. So it, its waste material has a high sugar content, and it invites sooty mold onto the sugar uh, that they release, and it renders the product non-viable for sale. And so the output of that is, yeah, it's damaged the fruit, it's no longer sellable, or you can't use it in the production of, say, like wine or, or beer, yeah. The other issue is that sooty mold can create some problems. It reduces the ability of plants to photosynthesize, and so it, it can kill the plants that way. And so what you see is like the, the bug is not like just going to take a bite out of like a, a vine and kill it instantly, but it will weaken its immune system, mm-hmm. opening up the door for other secondary mortality. And you can see like grapes, trees, and other things like that will die if there is a harsh winter or things like that. There are reports of some vineyards just totally just getting decimated and dying in a season. So that's just one small aspect. But there are control measures in place. There is information. 
just trying to make people aware and slowing the spread and prepare for the future. It's coming. It'll be here. Yeah, so the spotted lanternfly is coming to our region. It's something that we need to be aware of and prepared for. And there is information out there to help people with those outreach prevention and control options. They just need to just to be aware, especially with our growers. So I'm getting a little depressed, but I'm going to forge ahead and ask you about gypsy moths that we now call spongy moths, right? But most a lot of people are familiar with the name gypsy moth now called spongy moth. And, and it's depressing, too, because they're attacking my favorite tree, the oak tree. Uh, yeah, so the spongy moth. Two years ago, I was reporting spongy moth eggs. Very limited, hardly could see them following year they just took off last year was horrific i know up in the lake george region up into ticonderoga parts of saratoga county and schenectady county in our region was just brutal absolutely brutal so, so the defoliation is that yeah. what you're talking about yeah i was working in the woods and you know you have the sun visor on it was actually the poop visor you just hear it just dropping all day and that's a that's a common complaint really? like homeowners don't like that I mean, that's an issue with homeowners is, is the, the fecal material. But the defoliation, from the, there is an outbreak. We're going to be in year maybe two or three this coming year, depending on how bad it's been in other regions. But consider this maybe a four-year cycle right now. Some landowners should be aware that it's going to occur again this year, and it'll be with us probably the year after. And then the population may crash. They come in cycles. 12 to 15-year cycle, I've seen different numbers. It's around for, you know, that two to four years, and then it dies off. So if I see them on my oak trees, and I don't have tons and tons of them, I, I want to try to remove the eggs and the moth, or is that possible? Either? There's things that the homeowner can do. Uh, so please be aware that there are some biocontrol agents that have been released in the environment over time, and they will take action. So there's like a viral pathogen that does get introduced there's also a bacteria, it's in the soil, the viral pathogen I think is spread by the white-footed deer mouse. There's another fungus, so there's, there's multiple agents. There's at least three viral or fungal pathogens. Last year, I think we just had weather conditions that didn't allow for those naturalized biocontrols in the environment to kick up and knock down the populations. Some mice and birds and stuff will eat them, but it's not, you need all of those right. things occurring together to kind of make a difference. Right. Now, in terms of the, the homeowner, things like scraping the egg casings and squishing them and depositing them can help a tree. They are photoreactive when they're in the uh, caterpillar stage, so meaning at night, at sundown, they'll actually leave the tree. They will cast a silk and they fall from the tree. It's called ballooning and they'll go hide in the leaf litter and then the morning comes and then they crawl up the trunk again. You can do barrier bands mm -hmm. and collect them and smush them or use certain horticultural oils. There's something called BTK. You got to use that twice. It's when they're feeding, you have to apply it at the right time. Uh, you have to get the spray up in the tree, but you can help help protect your tree. I think the takeaway here is they're not necessarily going to kill your tree. Right. But there's, you know, there's clauses to that. Uh, I've read that old growth trees that really large tend to be more susceptible to mortality. Really? So maybe I would prioritize like a, a what I would call a heritage tree on mm -hmm. my property for treatment. Back to your elders, Tim. But those, <laughs> those are probably the hard, yeah, exactly. But those are probably the hardest ones to protect because they're so huge, right? I mean, I have those trees on my property, and I would go to the smaller ones because how am I going to climb up there and squish those caterpillars on the tall trees? So. You know, you see these old pictures of people climbing these trees, and that's kind of dangerous. Yeah. You know, again, the mortality, if it's a healthy tree on a good site with good conditions, it can handle the defoliation. The question is, can it handle two, three, four right. years of defoliation? That's when you start to worry. I would like to make a note with conifers, though. Conifers are even more susceptible to mortality. You know, you have 50% needle loss. They're not coming back. Like a white pine, would that be susceptible? Yeah, uh, we've reported some cases up north where there's been some pine stands, hemlock stands that have gotten hit rather hard. So hopefully maybe the climatic conditions will be favorable for the, natu the naturalized funguses and viruses to knock down the populations this year. Because it's not at the point where it's like, you know, complete another devastation. You'll notice 
that a lot of the red oaks that it prefers to eat first leafed out and they have a smaller diminutive leaf. So their systems are switching over to get garnish some photosynthesis. It's just a year that they take a hit. I'm sure that would show up in the growth rings, right? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm officially depressed. Well, I'm always depressed. Who else should we be worried about now? I'm thinking, I'm hearing rumors about things like fire ants and Eurasian boars and nutria. Am I going to have to lock myself in? Yes, the the nutria are are, are coming (laughs) today. The nutria, that, to my knowledge, are not a problem here in New York. Uh, I think in the uh, what is it, Chesapeake, Delaware River, so, they were. So we don't have them at all? Not that I know okay. of. What about the boars? I, I thought I saw boars here a couple of years uh, ago. So, so there are small game farms. There are hunting clubs that have novel approach to where they might release them and say, like, mm. uh, you yeah. know. And they use them for hunting as sport game. Sometimes they're in like forests that are fenced in or whatever, and and they escape. So there have been problems in the past. The state actually had an eradication program to eliminate the wild boar. From my knowledge right now, there's no real concerns out there with wild boar. But they still encourage people to report if they see the boar in the woods, even if, if they I don't saw know. a boar in the woods, I'd, you I'd know re- I'd report it. I'd report it. it. <laughs> I think I'd report it. Yeah, and then, you know, that might cause a confirmation to be done is, is it actually a wild boar or is it just some crazy dog on the loose or you know you know people just misidentify things but that would re- stimulate a response i do know the wild boar it it, it, it is very harmful to the environment yeah. they they grub and dig and they do just really and they have high reproductive rates so i know in the southern states it's just out of control and they're smart yeah well they they're pigs right so yeah. they're smart so I always say to people, as a gardener, depending on how thoughtful you are about what you plant and how you really maintain your property and what kind of steward you are, that you can make a difference. Do you agree with that? I do, 100%. I think we can be ecological stewards of our own yard. And again, if more people are actively being stewards of their own property, we would probably be in good shape. Most of the land holdings are owned in private ownership. Uh, I forget the numbers off the top of my head, but 70% of our forests are owned somewhere around there by private landholders. And then when we're talking about, you know, actual properties, uh, our yards, it's, it's more than 50%. So if we actively managed our property and became good stewards, identifying these problems, treating, controlling, prevention, prevention is the key. And planting natives, right? And, and planting natives. What can we do in our backyard? And I, I think it's just a new movement that needs to occur in, in New York. And, you know, just having that collective knowledge of knowing, okay, maybe I should look at native plantings first. Maybe I shouldn't be moving firewood around and taking measures to help protect our environment. We're looking at maybe starting a pledge to protect program. Yeah, I like that. Where, you know, you can just being aware of and identifying these issues and then taking a stand that like, I'm going to do what I need to do in my backyard. Because we know that in your backyard is where people have a vested interest and can make things happen. Right. And how many things can you actually say in the world that you can actually make a difference? Not many things, right? That you actually can do something and effectuate change. Yeah, I'd like to say like on small scales, we can all do our, our part and be fantastic. I think we found an optimistic way to leave. I like that. We're starting from our own backyard. Christopher, thank you so much for joining us today. You've given us lots and lots and lots to think about. I do encourage people to reach out to their local prism and seek help. Or if they need more information, that's a place to start. And you have you and you know, have a great website, too, yeah, definitely. Thank we'll, you. We'll include that in the show notes. Yeah, we're definitely. referring that in the show notes. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you for having me today. Everybody take care. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from a Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley.
You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green Counties Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 